Welcome to the Sharper Together podcast. We're built on the Proverbs 27:17 principle that as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Today's guest is Pastor Michael Tyson. He's the founder and lead pastor of Bedrock Church Bozeman in Bozeman, Montana. He's married to his wife, Ariel, and the proud father of six children. He's a graduate of Woodstock Church Plant School, Liberty University, and the Stephen Alford School of Preaching. He's also a member of the Send Church Plant Network and has planted two churches as well as been a part of a third. I'm your host, Michael Lee. Let's dive into today's episode and stay sharper together. Michael, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thanks so much. I'm doing fantastic. It's a beautiful, beautiful day out here. Let me ask you uh, a really tough theological question right off the bat. You ready? Let's go. All right. So what was it like growing up with the name Mike Tyson? Uh, it was never a problem for me. I, I, I really loved it. You know, I'm the fourth. So my dad goes by Mike and I was Michael, but growing up, I was growing up in the Mike Tyson boxer era, you know? So I, I don't remember how old I was when Mike Tyson bit Evander Holyfield's ear, uh, Holyfield's ear, but I was watching that fight when it happened. And, and that event definitely, um, made my name a lot more of, Oh, that's a famous name to like, don't buy my ears. I still get that. You know, I'll introduce myself and people will cover their ears. They don't buy my ears, but it never bothered me because I'm really proud of my name being named after my granddad and, we had the name first anyway. And then secondly, people tended to remember my name. So it's it's never been a problem. I've never, yeah, people have made fun of me, but it has never bothered me. So what is something that, that you're horrible at that you're possibly ashamed to admit? Well, I, I don't know if, I don't know if I have too much shame about it, but I'm pretty unorganized. So, but I'm, I'm really weird with that because I'm a, I, I'm a pretty organized person within myself, but it might not necessarily look organized to other people. So like, I know where all my stuff is and I really enjoy organization, but I don't enjoy the process of organizing. You know, one thing that I wish was different about me, uh, is, how much sleep I require. Like I'm a, I, I could sleep nine or 10 hours every night and I don't, you know, I usually sleep between six and seven, but like I sleep a lot. I I wish I could sleep a lot of hours every single night. And I've been that way my whole life. Yeah. It sounds like you're describing me or a little bit of organized (laughs) chaos from the outside. Uh, And I could sleep all day long if I was allowed to. Yeah. (laughs) What's your favorite story about your life that you love to tell? There's so many. I don't know if I can narrow it down to my singular favorite. I'll share a few, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. The first is my salvation story. And so my dad's a pastor. I grew up in the church and, and, and being there all the time. And so I had all this head knowledge. And I was just super religious, but I thought I was a Christian. And so I was trying to do, and I was doing, quote, all the Christian things. And I was telling one of my neighbors the gospel one day. And in the midst of sharing the gospel with my neighbor, the Holy Spirit convicted me for the first time that I didn't know him. And in the midst of me trying to lead somebody else to Jesus, I met Jesus. I surrendered my life to him that day. And I I love that story because... God took me from a, a religious practitioner or a, a, a legalistic viewer of Christianity, I guess, because I wasn't a practitioner, because I wasn't a participant. It took me from that to saved by grace and a believer. And <clears throat> that transition went from head knowledge to heart faith, placing my surrendering my life to Christ. And so that's one of my favorite stories. Another one of my favorite stories from my life is when I was three years old, my family was camping and my mom, we were staying at a camp. And so there were some cabins there and my mom had put myself and my brother down for bed in the cabin and had gone 
just down the hill to um, the dining hall with all my family. It's like a family re- reunion. And she said, I, I didn't want her to go. I didn't want to go to bed, first of all. And so I was like, Mom, why, why do you have to go? Why do you have to leave? She's like, oh, I've got to go get towels. Well, you know, I'm trying to find every excuse that I can to not go to bed. So I find a towel in the cabin and decide I need to go tell Mom that she doesn't need to leave because we have towels in the cabin. And so I leave the cabin. It's uh, about 10 o'clock at night and and pitch black dark in the middle of the Tennessee woods around Cherokee Lake, if anybody knows where that is. And I'm walking down the hill and I'm used to snakes. We lived in a place called Irwin, Tennessee at the time, way up in the mountains near North Carolina. And I was used to snakes. And so I come to these railroad tie stairs and I think I see a snake on the first step. So I step over the first step. Remember, I'm three years old, and uh, and I remember this so clearly. And I ended up stepping on a copperhead, and I got bit twice. The groundskeeper and his wife must have heard me crying or something. They come, find me, carry me into the dining hall. You know, all my aunts and uncles are there, and the doors fling open. And the road, it was like a gravel road, 45 minutes or an hour drive just to get into town. So it was maybe an hour and a half drive to, to the hospital at the time. So we took the boat across the lake, but it was nighttime. So we had one of my uncles was on the front of the boat with a flashlight. And one, another one of my great uncles was a dentist. And so he was basically a doctor. (laughs) So he was trying to take care of me. And, um, so we made it to the ambulance and I ended up spending five days in the hospital. And it's one of my favorite stories to tell kids on why they should obey their parents. (laughs) Um, Another one of my favorite stories is my call to come to Bozeman. I was on staff at First Baptist Woodstock in Woodstock, Georgia. And the church planting pastor there at the time, his name is Bill Agee. He's now in California. But he and I had become really good friends. And I was sitting in his office one day and he got a call from the state convention of Montana and they said, Bill, we would like to partner with first Baptist Woodstock to plant a church in Bozeman, Montana. And so I just happened to be in his office that day. I overheard the conversation. I said, Hey Bill, do you think there's any way I could go out there on that vision trip with you guys? Um, and he said, well, are you going to go plant a church out there? I said, definitely not. No, def- no, I'm just really interested. Like for some reason, the name just like, I just kind of want to go see it. He said, well, do you have room in your travel budget? I was like, no, I've got two or three more mission trips this year. So no more travel money. He's like, well, you can't go. And so from Woodstock, we moved to Raleigh and we we planted a church there with another pastor. And the whole time that we were there, I was so intrigued by Bozeman. And so I memorized citydata.com, which I'm not a, I'm not a nerd like that, although I love statistics, but I just ate up every piece of information I could about Bozeman for no reason. And when our time, when God made it clear our time in Raleigh was was coming to an end, we really ran from planting again right away. I, I, I wanted to go and serve under one of my mentors and, and learn some more and grow some more. And so I was going to go be a worship pastor in South Carolina, and that pastor and I met one final time and he said, Michael, I don't know what it is, but God just won't let us hire you. And he uh, said, I'm totally on board with that. And he leaned back in his booth. We were meeting at a Smithfield chicken. He said, Michael, have you ever thought about planting a church in Bozeman, Montana? And that was three years after I had first heard about Bozeman in Bill Agee's office, three and a half years. That was the straw that broke the camel's back, and I knew for sure that that's where God was calling me. That it wasn't a desire for me to be a mountain man. It was God's desire for my family to move here and serve Him in this way. And so we ended up, I owned a a business in Raleigh and pastored there, and we ended up making those transitions. And so that's that's one of my favorite stories. And then finally, one of my Another one of my favorite stories is when we were in Woodstock, we miscarried our first pregnancy. And Ariel discovered 
that she had a birth defect that would give her a 90% chance for miscarriage on every pregnancy. And there was a doctor in Atlanta who had invented a corrective surgery for that just five years previously. So Ariel had the surgery from the doctor who invented it. And on the due date of our first baby, we found out that we were pregnant with our second baby, who is our oldest son now. And so it's one of my favorite stories because God provides. And, and, and we, we lived in Atlanta for one year. And in that one year, I mean, we could have, we could have miscarried every single one of our pregnancies. And then um, I, I think the final one of my favorite stories is when I was in college, uh, Ariel and I served in ministry together. I was a, I had been a youth pastor at a couple of places. I had been a youth intern and I had been leading worship for some church planter gatherings uh, with a professor at the school at the time, Dave Early. So I thought I had been interviewed at this church in about 30 minutes away from college I was going to become their part-time youth pastor, and it paid really well at the time for part-time. And so it was great because I was still in school, um, but I could I could have this job. Ariel and I were married, and I had started working the job already. But I had, and the church had voted unanimously to call me, and the elders called me in and said, "Michael, uh, this was just a couple days before I was supposed to get my first paycheck. Michael, uh, God just won't let us hire you." And I was devastated. I remember riding my motorcycle home and just crying. And I didn't understand. It didn't make any sense. I, you know, I loved those kids. I already, already started working with, with them. And we had made plans. And it was so hurtful. And most of the time, it's really hard for us to look back on those moments and to see God's hand at work. But two days later, I was leading worship for a church planning gathering. And there was a guy named John G. Tate who spoke at that church planners gathering, who is the lead pastor of Bedrock Bedford, the first Bedrock church. And so Ariel and I decided to visit. I had some preaching engagements, so it took us a couple weeks to get out there. And we started on their eighth Sunday as a church and ended up doing a two-year church planting internship there. And now we've planted a Bedrock church. And so... Being able to look back and and see how God's hand is on everything and guiding and directing and giving us wisdom is just really encouraging. And so that's why that's one of my favorite stories is because sometimes things that seem really hurtful and don't make sense, because God's so powerful, He can work those things together for good for those people who love Him and are called according to His purpose. And I believe every person who's a Christian has been called according to God's purpose. Yeah, that's so good. I appreciate you sharing those stories. There's actually a couple questions that I that came out of what you just shared. I want to go back to the very first story you shared about sh- sharing Jesus to your neighbor. You made a statement. You said, I was sharing Jesus to her when I met Jesus. And uh, can you un- kind of unpack that for the person who's listening and going, well, what do you mean? Like you're out there witnessing for Jesus. What do you mean you just met him? Well, my best illustration for that is you can read a biography, you can read an autobiography, you can read everything, you can watch every YouTube video ever made about Donald Trump, and you can know everything about President Trump. You can know his birthday, how much he weighs, his favorite cake, every single thing. And you can go around and you can tell everybody about Donald Trump, every little detail. But if you've never personally met him, then you don't know him. And that's where I was with Jesus. Now, I didn't know everything about Jesus, but I knew a whole lot about Jesus. I had a lot of head knowledge, a lot of information. And I believed that information, but I had never placed my eternal um, faith and trust and surrendered the lordship of my life to Christ. And, And I had never met him. I had never met him. And... So that's what happened on that day. I'm trying to I'm trying to impart the knowledge that I have to my neighbor Sam was his name. And in the midst of that, I realized that it's just knowledge. It's just head knowledge. I had never internalized it. I had never I had never had faith that caused me to 
do things different in my life. I was just trying to earn my way, I guess. I, I was trying to do what Christians are supposed to do. And that's the difference between being born again and being trapped in the the ongoing process of religion. Because um, there's going to be a lot of people who have done Christian things with their life, but they've never known Jesus Christ. And that's a tragedy. Um, and those people are going to spend eternity apart from him. That's what I mean by that. I'm, uh, you can know all about Jesus. You can know all about him and have never met him. Just like you can know about our president and never have met him and not actually know him. Yeah, that's great. Can you, for the person who may be listening right now and, and is thinking, well, gosh, I know, I know a lot, I know a lot about Jesus, but how, how can I be sure that I know him? What would you say to that person? Well, uh, I think the first thing that I would say is, has there ever been a point in your life, a, a singular point or a, a cluster of points in your life when you surrendered your life to Christ, when you experienced the Holy Spirit convicting you or calling you or helping you to realize your need for a Savior. If you've never experienced that, then you should seriously seriously evaluate if you personally know Jesus. Secondly, if I were to ask you a question, so what's different about your life before you met Jesus and after you met Jesus, and you say, I don't know or nothing, then I propose that you probably have never met him. And, um, and that goes for people who are really young when they come to Christ or think that they come to Christ as well. Uh, for me, I, I was pretty young. The transition is obvious to me. I was super religious to now I get to serve. I have this privilege to serve my king in this way. And I still tell people about Jesus at every chance that I get. It's still a passion of mine. But now it's out of a personal relationship, not out of head knowledge. There was an old pastor, Adrian Rogers, who said it this way in talking about the moment of salvation. He said, "Some let's just imagine, Michael, that you and I are driving to Atlanta, and, or you're driving and I'm flying. You know the moment that you crossed into the Atlanta city limits because there's a sign there. You, you know the moment that you went from Cobb County or wherever into the city of uh, of Atlanta, but I'm flying and I don't know the exact moment that I crossed that line. But when I'm at the airport, I know I'm in Atlanta and salvation can be that same way for, for most people. You have a moment that you know for sure that that's the moment that you surrendered your life to Christ. But there are other people that it was, it was around this moment. It was these couple days, or it was a couple weeks, it was based on a couple conversations, but you know for sure that you're there now. And so um, those would just be a couple of the first things that I would say to somebody who would ask me that is genuine for real evaluation. Don't sweep things under the rug and don't make assumptions about your life because there's too much at stake. Um, genuinely evaluate based on the criteria that Jesus himself gives about his followers. That's a great illustration. I want to go back to, you were talking about uh, your first uh, child that you miscarried. That's miscarriages uh, in so many people's stories. You have six children now. So what is something that having six kids has taught you about God? It's reminded me that God loves diversity. God has created every single person completely unique with a completely unique skill set. And has created every single person in that unique that uniqueness and that creativity with the desire to use it for his glory and our good. And as I look at my six sons, every single one of them is so different. Um, and, and they're good at different things and they struggle with different things, even though they're my offspring and my wife's offspring. They have different aspects and they demonstrate different parts of each one of us, my wife and I. And that's reminded me um, about that, 
uh, relationship with God, that God has a plan and a purpose for people's uniqueness and creativity. He doesn't want cookie cutter people. He wants you to be the best that you can be because he created you to be purposeful and unique based in who you are. And even with your unique struggles, um, struggling is a part of life. Succumbing to that struggle and, and embracing it is not God's plan for your life. God wants you to find victory and to be able to demonstrate his power through your life to those around you. Now, you and, and Ariel have a YouTube uh, channel. Since we're talking about your family, I, I want to go in this direction. You talked about in one of them, you've done, uh, I think, two Q&A videos. And in one of them, you, you talked about how to stay close to your spouse when you have kids. You gave this uh, illustration where somebody had mentioned, I think it was on Ariel's uh, Instagram, the person wrote, how can you love uh, or prioritize your spouse when your kids came from you? And you gave an incredible answer. And I don't know if you remember it or not, but you talked about how you can prioritize your spouse because you became one. And so I'd love for you to just unpack or just talk about a little bit about how do you stay close to your spouse when you've got uh, multiple children? Yeah, we did just start YouTube. We started that uh, by request. It's been a lot of work and and a lot of learning for me. I don't have a background in that kind of stuff. I, it's easy for me to make content. To, but it's hard for me to finalize and edit and organize that content. So just learning. But that came out of Ariel's Instagram and the influence that God's allowed in her life. To answer your question, I think the heart of it is, view, is how you view your spouse. I think a lot of people have this idea of their spouse as not a part of them. In other words, if your kid were to hurt your feelings, if they were to go against your will, if they were to make terrible decisions, most people are still going to choose to love their kids. And and people that we've talked to would be like, "Well, of course, because they're my flesh and blood. Like I'm never going to leave my kids. I'm never going to I'm never not going to I'm never going to stop loving my kids even when they don't make me happy." But yet Most people don't view their spouse that way. They say, well, my spouse is here to make me happy. My spouse is here to fulfill me. My spouse is here. And and if it's just not working out anymore, then we just don't have to be together. But of course, we would never do that to our kids. And I I just propose that, that God's plan for marriage is so much deeper, that Ariel is just as much my family as my kids are. She and I are each other's blessing. And that has to be a choice because your spouse is not always going to make you happy. And happiness is an emotion. And if you let your emotions control you, then you will never accomplish everything that you're supposed to. If There's nothing wrong with the emotion of happiness. But if you let that rule your life, then you'll constantly be chasing the emotion of happiness. You're then, then at that point, you're allowing yourself to be controlled by your emotions instead of controlling your emotions. I, I think really that might be one of the most important foundational aspects is to help marriages, especially married people with kids, is the mindset of your spouse. Like your spouse needs you more than your kids need you. Because your spouse is there to be with you the rest of your life. Your kids are there for you to raise and to shape and to mold for a short period of time and shoot them out into the world with purpose um, for God's glory and the world's good. And, you know, you have 936 weeks from birth to 18. 936. My oldest son is halfway done, over halfway done with those. You, you have a short period of time to instill things in your kids, but you need to focus most on your marriage because the way that you impact your kids in the healthiest way is to have the healthiest marriage that you possibly can. The way that you impact your kids longer than just 18 years or however long they live in the house is by having a model for them to look up to. And, um, and listen, uh, man, I'm just 
overwhelmed by God's grace in my life that when we blow it, he still offers me grace. And so there's people listening who have been through divorce or they're struggling in their marriage. Listen, God has grace for your life, but he has he has a beautiful plan moving forward from today. And so I just want to encourage you if you're a parent with kids or maybe you, uh, or, or you're married with kids or maybe you don't have kids yet to just begin to kind of shift your mindset to your spouse being <laughs> like there, there's no closer family member that you could have than your spouse. And I think a lot of people think there's no closer family member that you, you can have than your kids. And I would disagree with that. When you given that answer about how you've become one, that's really the only relationship uh, in scripture where you become one with someone is your spouse. And so your kids, like you said, the goal is to send them out and one day they'll become one with their spouse. Uh, yeah. One other thing you talked about in one of your videos was that how you and Ariel don't talk about everything. So you don't come home and spill out every detail of your day. And so just kind of unpack that um, practice that you and Ariel have of of not unloading on everything. And that person who's listening might think, well, what, what does that mean? You're keeping secrets from your spouse. But but talk about the idea behind why you don't talk about everything. Well, um, as I mentioned before, my dad's a pastor and it was an awesome opportunity for me to learn and watch him. My life is so much about the church, um, my relationships, my friendships, my job. But it's also my family's life because every and my kids are in ministry with me too. They all serve in the set up and tear down team for church. You know, the, um, Ariel has ministries within the church, and so it it could become all consuming for us. We could come home and talk about um, a hard conversation that we had, or it would be easy for me to share things, even that I have. Uh, of course, that I would have permission from other people to share with Ariel, but that they would be unnecessary burdens on her um, emotional capacity to carry, and vice versa. You know, she she's got to be aware of timing of when to have certain conversations with me. Sunday morning before church is not a time to have a fight. It's not a time to have a distracting or important conversation. I think a lot of people, young pastors especially, really struggle with this because they feel like they're supposed to tell their spouse everything. And that's not true. And and here's why. Someone can say something really hurtful to you in a meeting, and then the next day they apologize and you come back together and you're just as good of friends as you were before. But if your spouse, if you go and you say, so-and-so hurt me in this way, it's much, much harder for them to let go of that pain, for them to let go of that resentment because they're hurting their your, their spouse. This person is hurting their spouse. It's not that you don't tell your spouse those things. I would just say be cautious and don't feel like you have to share every single little thing. And then on top of that, just like normal day-to-day life stuff, like Ariel and I have so much going on that we just don't take the time to talk about an unimportant things. I guess a huge part of that is being consumed by talking about people. I think a lot of people unintentionally talk about people because they kind of, that's their default. When they're trying to have a conversation and connect with somebody, the only thing that they know to do is to talk about other people. And Ariel and I just don't do that. We have so many more important things to talk about. Ideas, vision, dream of the future, plans. Um, We talk about our, our financial budget. We talk about the plan for our kids, we talk about, hey, what's our schedule this week? Um, what do we want to grow in? What do we want to accomplish as a family? What are you doing together? How can we help each other? Those are the kinds of conversations that we have. You know, this this YouTube thing was born out of Ariel's Instagram. And so, yeah, we've been doing YouTube just a couple months and, and not very good yet. But Ariel's um, over 230 235,000 followers on Instagram. And it's just really born a lot of, pa- uh, kind of brought to the surface a lot of passions that we have for marriages and for families. And so we just don't have time to talk about. And another part of it too is you can waste emotional capacity in talking about stuff too much. 
hurtful things or hard things. We definitely talk about decisions that we're making for sure. We talk about all of those things and we ask each other thoughts and, and we make, we, we seek each other's wisdom on, on stuff. And I know that she's also written a book uh, called Chase the Roar. You want to talk a little bit about that book and, and just kind of her heart behind the book, what it's about? So about, I think it was um, right before our fourth son was born, I think, uh, maybe our fifth. The book's been out three or five years, something like that. And she released it right before uh, one of our sons was born. The subtitle is How to Become Faith Chasers in an American Dream Culture. And God wants every single believer to achieve their potential for Him. And sometimes that includes making a lot of money or or being in a position of influence so that you can influence people for him, et cetera, et cetera. But that shouldn't be our primary focus. So a lot of times we'll talk to people and they'll be like, yeah, we're moving um, because, you know, we, we're making, we're going to make $10,000 more at this job. Well, that's fantastic. That's great. God, God wants you to, there's nothing wrong with you making more money if you're a good steward of what God entrusts to you. But is that the primary factor and ruler of your life? Does God want you to live in that place for ministry? Because we we believe the Bible teaches that every Christian is a minister. Every Christian has a ministry, and that should be the primary focus of your life, to create disciples in your unique ministry within the church and personally. And, and our jobs can sometimes be a part of our ministry, but the I guess the the focus of it is helping us to shift our focus to focus on being faith chasers instead of American dream chasers. Um, it's a great book. It's not just for women. I've read it a couple times. It tells a little bit of our story about how we came to Bozeman and, and stuff like that. And then at the end of every chapter, there's a little work page to help you grow in your faith and to make faith steps. So yeah, I highly recommend it. It's on Amazon. Ariel's Instagram handle is Ariel C. Tyson. And then our YouTube is The Tysons. And my Instagram is Michael E. Tyson IV for the fourth. We'll make sure we link those in the show notes here too. So people can just click the links uh, down below the episode. What you said there about everybody having a ministry. I want to dive into that because I think there's this confusion about um, in America about how pastors are the ones in ministry. And so sometimes people feel like, well, I don't have a ministry. I'm not called to be a pastor. Uh, can you unpack that a little bit more? Yeah, it is one of the biggest misconceptions that the American church and maybe more than just the, the American church has that we hire pastors if we want to do more ministry. And I would agree with that to a certain point, but the job of a pastor is to be an administrator within the church. Timothy, uh, or Paul said to Timothy, that the job of a pastor is to equip the church for the work of the ministry. You're, as, as a pastor, your job is to teach the church, people within your church, through discipleship, how to do ministry. And when a pastor is the main minister also, the church will never become all that it can be. Yes, a pastor should have a ministry because I'm a Christian. My ministry is X. Uh, I have a preaching ministry. But that's also a part of, of me equipping other people to do their ministries, is that teaching. And that's really, really important because the Bible talks about the church being a body. And everybody, every has everybody has a member. You're a member of the body. Everybody has a function. You have a job to do. And when you're not doing your job, the body isn't functioning right, and it's not functioning to its potential. Reaching people for Christ is your job as a Christian. It's not your pastor's job. It's not your neighbor's job. It's not your your Bible school uh, Bible class teachers. It's not your professor's job. It's your job. And, and you've got to take that ownership. Not only that, but God has given you unique talents. You know, just like I was talking about, like my sons, God's made you unique for a purpose. And part of that purpose is he has a unique shape 
for ministry for you. And if you're not living in that and growing in that and fulfilling that, then who is? Who's reaching those people? Who's serving those people? Who's accomplishing that task at your church? And if you're a Christian and you're not a part of a church, and I don't mean an attender, I mean a part a part of a church, a member of a church, then you're the one, um, you're an orphaned child of God. And you're not living in God's purpose for your life. And I can say that because that's what the Bible says. And so I just want to encourage, if you're a believer listening to this, you have a ministry that God has prepared for you. You need to dive into it and embrace it and grow in it and become, you know, some of those aspects might be really hard for you. You might not be naturally good at certain aspects that are required for that ministry. Grow, challenge yourself. Remember, life is a race, and racing is not always easy, uh, but it's worth it. Yeah, you're talking about your role as a pastor is to equip the saints for the ministry that God has for them. And that can be discouraging seeing the potential that people have if they step into their God-given role. But what would you say is the most discouraging or the most defeating aspect of being a pastor? There's a few different aspects to that, but I think to narrow down what what's one of the most hurtful things that can happen to a pastor is most pastors are visionaries. We can see what could be in a person's life, in corporate life, within the church, in a, in a small group's life. And to see people succumb to spiritual warfare and not even be aware of it and to do damage unintentionally usually to God's kingdom is one of the most discouraging and and hurtful things. When, when you make statements on social media or you uh, have conversations that are dissension or whatever, you've got to remember You've got to remember the Bible says that we're at warfare every single day and that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but against spiritual things. And when we lose sight of that, then we can do things as a result of spiritual warfare that damage. Maybe God's working in somebody's life and because we complain about this person at church, they're like, oh yeah, I forgot all those people are hypocrites. I'm definitely not visiting this week, (laughs) you know? And um, that's probably one of the most disappointing things about being a pastor is being able to see what could be and how God can use people and then um, watching them not live in that potential is, uh, is tough. And, and vice versa, definitely for me, the most rewarding thing is seeing people live in life change, seeing people discover their ministry for God, seeing people get excited and grow in Jesus. You know, that's, that is my ministry. That's what I love seeing. I love spending time with new believers and seeing them grow and seeing them bring their friend, friends to Christ. And so, um, yeah, but, and, and I guess that's why that can be the most discouraging thing for me too, is because that's the greatest passion that God's given to me is to see Christians live a non-apathetic life for Christ. Yeah, you're talking about the spiritual warfare aspect of this life. And you look at the year 2020, it's unlike anything we've ever seen. And you see that being played out in our world today. Can you talk about what God has been teaching you in this year, what God has been teaching you in this moment? Um, number one is to rest more. That's definitely the, uh, 100% the number one thing. Ariel and I are so driven. We're so, uh, we're such people, people, people um, that we just, we, we were so overextended and we knew it, but everything that we were doing, we cared so much about and we weren't sure what to cut out. And we battled with that for years and it definitely this year, through the pandemic has given us the opportunity to kind of reshape our schedule. And, uh, you know, Ariel has these post-it notes all over our house and it says what matters most right now. And, and we've had that up for probably two years, but 
even in the midst of that, it's kind of, it's not as easy as saying what matters most right now, because you've got people pulling on you in every direction. Um, you've got your job, you've got your family, you've got your friends, you've got, if you've got your ministry, you've got your church or your small group, you've got your hobbies, you know, you've got all these things, these financial pressures, these emotional pressures, these interpersonal pressures pulling on you. And sometimes it's really hard to decide, okay, you know what, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to choose to cheat somebody today of what I wish I could give them and maybe even what they deserve. But I'm going to choose to cheat my job today, not every day, but today, so that I don't cheat my kids out of what they deserve from me. Um, Because they have a sports game today and I will be there to support them and let them know or, or whatever, you know, but Um, I think that's number one for sure is um, we just weren't resting enough. And by resting, I don't mean sleep. I don't mean a Sabbath day because we we started really taking a Sabbath day a couple years ago. I mean like letting, letting go of your mental and emotional work. Because if you're a driven person, it, that's the hardest parts parts to set down. You can you can take a Sabbath day, a day off, and be like, okay, I'm not working today. But meanwhile, you're emotionally entangled with your job or with your friends or with your church, and mentally being distracted from what matters most in that moment. And so, that's been the biggest learning experience for us. I read an article this week, uh, the study. The survey was done, says one in five pastors are on the verge of quitting in, in the U.S. because of stress from COVID. You know, they, their churches are complaining to them. Half the churches are like, the masks are stupid. This is a scamdemic. And the other half are like, you're going to kill people if we meet. And you've got all these different opinions. And everybody's got an opinion. And everybody is, everyone is like maxed out with self-control right now. <laughs> they've been staying at home. So their self control is maxed out in what they're eating. They want to, they want to eat junk food, but they can't gain weight. Everyone's self control is maxed out because they're on social media and they see comments that anger them and they've been holding back, but now they can't hold back anymore. And so everybody is just like venting everything right now. You've got, um, you've got this spiritual war in our country that's going on and this this war for what what our country is going to be. And then on top of that, you've got this sickness that's going around. And then on top of that, you've got churches are doing things that we've never done before, like not meeting once a week, at least gathering together. Um, And church online is awesome, but that's not church. That is an aspect that's important, but the Bible says you've got to gather together. You got to be with people. And, uh, and so that doesn't mean that you, you don't take a couple weeks off because of, uh, health reasons or, or things like that. But if you've let, um, this create a new habit of not attending and participating in your church, then you're the one living in sin. If you haven't been back to church now and you don't have a legitimate health reason, you're the one you have now lived in sin. Those are just kind of some of my thoughts on what what the pandemic's done for us, for us, it's been opposite of what most of my pastor friends have experienced. They've been more stressed out. They've had more workload. You know, I felt like I was on vacation when we were in quarantine because all I was doing was leading worship and preaching. I think the reminder to that is that no matter what's going on in your life, you have a choice to make. How are how are you going to allow your life to stress you out and to affect you? Because no one else can control that for you. Only you can. Just kind of shifting gears a little bit here. What are, what would you say are some of the best resources that have helped you in your walk with the Lord or, and just your faith? What are some of the best resources um, that you've gone to that have helped shape you the most? Uh, Well, the number one resource for sure is my mentors. First of all, I'm an experiential learner. That's just crucial to me. And a lot of people ask me, Michael, how do you get these mentors all across the country? I seek them out. <laughs> I go to them. I put myself around them. I, I do that. So I was at Bedrock in Bedford. I was an intern there for two years. I served in ministry. I helped uh, lead worship there. I led small groups there while I was there. I learned. 
I was under John G. Tate and Chris Dowd. I learned from those guys. Um, and, and even before that, I learned from my dad. I learned from other people that I worked under. And then I went to First Baptist Woodstock to intern, do a pastoral mentorship with Johnny Hunt, who was the pastor there at the time. And so those guys I've just mentioned are still influencers in my life today. They're still men that I seek for wise counsel. Another one of my mentors is Bill Agee, who I mentioned. Another one of my mentors is Dave Minton, who's a pastor in Olympia, Washington. Uh, another one of my mentors is a pastor named Bruce Spear. And each one of these guys has, has very different perspectives, but I invite them to speak into my life. And so that would be my number one resource. If you want to grow, get a mentor. That's my number one resource for for. Uh, practical resource. Uh, well, I, I say that. Let me caveat that. Your your real number one resource for growth, and this is for business growth, um, personal growth, dedication growth, spiritual growth, is to have a, a, a daily Bible study plan. That's number one. So I'm kind of making that assumption that you're pursuing that. And then uh, the second aspect of that is mentorship in your life. Uh, You've got to have a coach and a mentor. You've got to have people that can give you wise counsel, people that you want to emulate, people that you want to look like in certain areas of your life, Uh, people that you can learn from and develop and bounce bounce ideas off of, people who have been where you want to go. Your, Your personal relationship with Jesus and your relationship with others. And I mean, that's... (laughs) <laughs> those are the two greatest commandments, right? Love God with all your heart and love others as yourself. And loving others as yourself is is becoming, uh, in part, is becoming everything that you're supposed to be. And, and you can only do that from learning from other people. You can't do it by yourself. Yeah, and don't be afraid to ask, like you said. The worst that can happen is they say, no, they don't have the time to do that right now. So don't be afraid to ask for mentors. Yeah, and another aspect of that is, a lot of people come to me and they're like, hey, pastor, will, will you disciple me? But they're not in my life group and they're not in any life group. They're not coming and being uh, at my, they're not in my leadership class that I teach. They're not. And so there's all these opportunities for you to put yourself around me. Um, and if somebody isn't taking advantage of those opportunities, I'm much less likely to devote more of my time out of my schedule because I only have so much space to that person. Uh, And it does depend on their circumstance. But if you're looking for a mentor, put yourself around them. If you know that, that your path, you want to learn from your pastor and you, how about this? Hey pastor, um, does anybody, is there like a group of people in your, in the church that prays for you before church gets started on Sundays? No? Okay. Would you mind if I started doing that for you? And just go and, and spend five minutes with your pastor every Sunday morning before church, before Bible study, before whatever that first thing is, and just pray over them. Um, and then get some other people. Um, pastor, if, if I got a group of guys together, two other guys, would you be willing to meet with us to, to teach us some things once a month or whatever? Uh, you be the pursuer um, and you put yourself around those people. My mentors live all across the country. Two years ago, I flew to Olympia, Washington six times that year. And I paid for that out of my own pocket to be with my mentor there, Dave Minton. Last year, I flew to Atlanta just so that I could ride on another airplane with Johnny Hunt to Missouri. And then he he allowed me to spend a couple days with him in Missouri. But I would have flown just so that I could sit beside him for that two hour flight from Atlanta or yeah, about two hours, just so I could talk to him face to face. Cause I can call him and text him whenever I want. But I guess that's my number one recommendation to anybody who's looking for a mentor is you've got to want it. If you want to grow, if you want to learn, then seek it out. It's not just going to fall in your lap. You can't just be like, well, I've never been discipled. Well, go find a discipler. Like if you want to grow, then start growing. (laughs) Uh, So another person's not going to make you grow. Uh, So those would be kind of, yeah, for me, those are, those are two of my biggest growth resources is definitely my personal relationship with the Lord, 
journaling through that, um, through my Bible reading, and then mentorship. Um, reading is awesome. Education through school is awesome. I believe in those things. I read all the time, but that is not the greatest resource for me. I don't learn the best that way. Some people do, but even if you do, you're still supposed to be discipled and make disciples. So that that's my thoughts on that. Yeah. And going along with this idea of mentors, I was sitting under Dr. James Merritt once, and he was talking about the process in which he went about getting mentors, very similar to what we're saying here and just seeking them out. And Johnny Hunt's actually one of his mentors as well. So small world there. But one of the things that he was saying is once you get that sit down with the mentor, make sure you have a specific list of questions that you want to dive into so that you're not wasting their time. In other words, just come prepared once you get that sit down. And then also be okay with just a car ride. If, if, if your business mentor needs a ride to the airport, you'd be the first person to volunteer to give that ride, like with no agenda, but then you can, you're just putting yourself because you get, if you get to be the fly on the wall, you are learning. You get to learn like, Hey, what does this person do in that 30 minute ride to the airport? Are they, you know, just goofing off. Are they playing a game? Are they, are they like, what are they doing? I I just want to soak up every little detail. And then I want to apply the things that I can to my life. And that's for, for business growth, for spiritual growth, personal development, whatever, you know, it, it, it goes for all of that. Yeah, that's, that's some excellent advice. I want to talk about, um, you gave a message on Sunday, uh, about, uh, five purposes for every believer. You, you talked about, and I think this was so powerful, and I'd love for you to just to talk about this and unpack this statement, but you asked your congregation, you said, if God asked you why he should give you 15 more years, what would you say? And that's such an incredible question that when, when I was watching that and you said that, I was like, whew, that's good. So uh, just take a few minutes and just kind of just talk about uh, that part of the message and, and just kind of your idea behind that question. Well, the main text for that sermon was kind of on the, on the life of King Hezekiah and King Hezekiah uh, was told that he was going to die. And he was, Hezekiah was the greatest King in, in the history of Israel and Judah. And he turned over in his bed and he prayed to God and he said, God, you, you see what I've done with my life. Would you please extend my life? Cause I want to do more for you. And God said that he would give him 15 more years. And so that's the catalyst for that question is that story from Hezekiah. Of like, if you say that you're going to do something for God, but you haven't done anything for God yet, then what evidence is there in your life that you're going to do anything with the rest of your life? I think so many people think, oh, when I get out of college, oh, when I get married, oh, when I settle down and have kids, Oh, when the kids are out of the house. Oh, when I retire, then I will do something for God. Then I will do that thing that God's put on my heart. And then I talk to retired people and they say, oh man, we're just too tired now. We're just so old. We've got the grandkids. We've got the, we don't have what, you know, there's an excuse at every turn. And so God wants you to do something with your life today, right now. You could die tomorrow anyway, so don't hold back today. Don't live today in light of what might or might not happen tomorrow. Live today for today. The root of that is like, God might have placed something on your heart, but you're too busy or too consumed or too scared to do something with it or about it. And you're waiting on this day that will never come. It'll never come. You're saying, oh, you know, this sin that I'm trapped in, I'll get rid of it when? No, you won't. The easiest time to say yes to God is right now. Not tomorrow. It's right now. The easiest time was yesterday, but yesterday is gone. So now the easiest time is right now in this moment. It'll never be easier to say yes to God and to live in your purpose than it is right now. So that's my my heart behind that. That's what I beg God for in my own life. God, would you, and, and God's measure of success 
is not based on the accomplishments that are visible. It's based on your obedience to him, period. That's it. Uh, that's really, really important because some people might be listening and they're like, wow, but I've been trying, but like it looks like nothing's happened. And I, I always ask people this question when they say that. Hey, you ever heard of Billy Graham? And most people are like, yeah, yeah, I've heard of Billy Graham. Well, um, you know, he led tens of thousands of people to the Lord, right? Like tens of thousands of people are going to be in heaven because of Billy Graham. But who led Billy Graham to the Lord? What was that guy's name? What was his significance in the kingdom of God? And and nobody I've asked that question to knows that guy's name. And in fact, I've looked up his name several times, and you can find it on Google, but I can't remember the guy's name right now. But in that moment, when he had the opportunity to lead Billy Graham to Christ, he was obedient to Jesus. What if he had had an excuse? Well, no, I don't want to. What would have happened? And so your success in God's kingdom is not based on what looks visible to you and to everybody around you. It's based on your obedience to Christ, period. So how obedient are you being to the things that God's put in your life? The, the passions he's given you, the ministry that he's given you. Do you even know what your spiritual gifts are? Do you even know what your shape for ministry is? Like everything in your life has built you for this thing that God wants to use you for, to utilize you for. If God were to ask you right now, hey, you know what? I'm just going to like, you're going to die tomorrow. And you were to say, God, let me do more for the next five years of what I have done for the past five, would there be any productivity for his glory in that? And that is uh, an evaluation question that's super critical because if you're waiting to start, like a lot of guys that I talk to that are called to be pastors, but um, they're in seminary or they're in college right now, they feel like their ministry hasn't started yet. Their calling hasn't started yet. And that's not true. Your calling started the day that you were called to start living in it. Start growing. Start start acting like what you're going to be. Because if you don't now, you never will. And, uh, and so I guess that's just my passion in that question of like, start today. The easiest time to say yes is today. God cares more about obedience than knowledge. Um, he cares more about what you do with what you do know than how much you know about him. He never asks you to know everything about him, but he does ask you to say yes to him every time that he asks you for something. Yeah. And one of the most practical ways that we can step out in obedience today is to be a witness for Christ, a witness of what he's done in our lives. And in that message, you talked about the idea of an attorney versus a witness. You want to kind of just give a brief uh, overview of that as well. Cause I, it's so easy for people to go, well, I, I'm afraid that I'm going to, I'm going to do it wrong or, or, I, you know, I'm not going to have an answer to what to say if they ask me a question. So just talking about the difference between being a witness for Christ and his attorney. Yeah. Well, Jesus doesn't need somebody to defend him in the court of law. <laughs> and that's what an attorney's job is. And I think a lot of Christians think that they have to be God's attorney and they have to convince the court on why the court should follow Jesus or whatever. And that's not true. God never asked you to be his attorney. He asked you to be his witness. And all a witness does is get up on the stand and answer the questions and be 100% truthful and tell the truth. And if you're a Christian, if you're a born again Christian, then you are an eyewitness to the power of God. And God wants you to share your testimony. He wants you to learn. He wants you to um, experience things in your life that can relate to other people. But it's not your job to convince the court. It's your job to be a witness. God is the one who will convince. God is the attorney. God is the mediator. He's the one who will convince someone or not, or convict someone. And then they have to make a choice with that. It's just your job to share the information and to be obedient to whatever God asks you to do. Michael, if you were in my shoes, if you were interviewing yourself, what is, uh, what's, what's one question? What's something that you would ask yourself? Uh, I would ask me if I've ever wanted to quit and why, and if so, why I haven't. D yeah. Do you want to, uh, do you want to answer that question? No, <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Yeah, I'll answer it. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. I've definitely wanted to quit being a pastor a whole lot of times. 2017 was the worst year of my life for Ariel and I both. And uh, there was one specific night. A couple had just left our house telling us that they were leaving the church. A couple that we had planned the church together with. A couple that we had seen get married. A couple that we had seen uh, get saved. Told us they were leaving the church. And there was a bunch of turmoil going on in our lives and in the church at the time. I remember collapsing on the floor and just bawling. I went in my closet shut the door and just bawled uncontrollably and begged the Lord to release me from my call. I I told him, God, if you will release me, I will go and I'll make as much money as I can. And I will be a part of a church plant. I will serve in that church plant. I will do whatever you want me to do in that church plant. And I will give as much money that you entrust to me to that church plant to finance the ministry of that. I just can't be the leader anymore. I can't take this anymore. And this is just one story. Discouragement is real, but you have a choice of whether to quit or not. I told God, I said, I will not quit. I will not quit, but please let me stop. And he didn't release me. Thank goodness. And and he never has to this day. And maybe one day he, he will, I'll be finished, but people quit too soon. People quit too soon. That's something really, really, really important to me. Do not quit. Now, you might be finished. You might have accomplished what you're supposed to do um, at your job or on this team that you committed to on your on your service within your church and your ministry. You, you might have co- completed something and finished it, and that's great. But don't ever quit. It's not worth it to quit. And, man, that's a really short answer to that question. But that's uh, really been a, a major factor in my life is there you can find a way to make it through. You can do it. And it's worth it. Uh, the only story that I have of that is last year, one year ago this weekend, actually. I was preaching a men's conference in Olympia, Washington for my friend Dave Minton at Capital Christian Center. Uh, we loaded up the whole family. We were going to go and camp on the Oregon coast for three or four days after the men's conference. And so we had a, a little U-Haul trailer behind our excursion that we had our bicycles and our tent and stuff in. And we made it about an hour away from our house and the head gasket blew on the excursion. So we were able to limp it back into town, pulling over every 10 minutes, letting it cool down, blah, blah, blah. Well, our our second vehicle was a 96 Suburban. So I had been doing some work on it. The trailer hitch was off. So I had had to put the trailer hitch back on, rewire the wires. We get everything loaded up. We get on the road. We make it an hour outside of town again, and the engine blew on our car. Uh, I had an intern at the time, Jake, and he had a Honda Pilot. I said, I called him up and said, hey, man, uh, how many seats do you have in your Honda Pilot? He said, eight. I said, cool. Can you and your roommate drive out here. Is it possible that I could borrow your car for a couple weeks? And he, he graciously let me do that. We drove a Honda pilot, all, all of us. And, uh, we had five kids at the time. Our six wasn't born yet. So we had seven people in that Honda pilot and, uh, we're about, uh, I don't, I don't know how many miles we drove, but lots and lots of miles. We're not, we're not that close. It's like 10 hours to Olympia or something like that. So, <clears throat> I was talking with Dave Minton and he said, Michael, I honestly just thought that you were just going to be like, well, God obviously doesn't want me to come preach this men's conference. It's just too much of a hassle. (laughs) We're we're not going to make it. But I had made a commitment that I was going to preach at that men's conference. I had made a commitment that I was going to take my family camping and I was going to do, I was going to exhaust every resource that I could to accomplish those things. Now, if I, if I exhaust every resource, and then there's no way to complete it. Well, then, okay, I wasn't supposed to do it. But people, I just in my experience in life, people give up too soon. People quit too soon. People think things are harder than they really are too soon. You can do so much more than you think you can in your own self, much less as a Christian through the power of the Holy Spirit, what you can make it through.
and what you can accomplish and what you can do. So <clears throat> do not quit. You know, I, if, if there's something that I wish that my life would represent to people and inspire people and encourage people to do, it would be to not quit. You can grow and you can, you can um, shift and God can move you, but do not quit. And don't chase the wrong things. Be, be a faithful, committed person, especially when it's hard. Because when it's hard is when your faithfulness and commitment is challenged, not when it's easy. Yeah, that's that's such a great uh, answer. I appreciate you sharing that story and, and answering that question. I love that question because you never know uh, what type of question you're going to get from the person you're speaking with. So I appreciate you sharing that story. Okay. I got one last question for you. Uh, and you might have just answered it uh, with your encouragement to never quit. But I'll ask you anyway, just in case it's different. If you had an opportunity to say one thing to the listener, uh, not one word, but kind of one big idea, one big encouragement can be anything you want. What, what would you say to them? I think I would say, don't be distracted by your daily life so much that it distracts you from what your life is supposed to be. We, we sweep things under the rug so easily, like dreams, passions, convictions from God. Um, we, we just sweep those under the, thing, uh, under the rug of busyness so easy. You have a purpose, and your purpose is way bigger than you think it is. And God wants you to, to discover it. He's not trying to hide it from you. But we've got to remember that the Bible tells us that life is a test. And some of us keep failing the same test over and over and, and saying, God, why is my life hard? Why, is this, why, why are you testing me in this way? And he's saying, man, I don't want to test you because it's hard. I want to test you to make sure you're ready for the next level. Just like when you're in school. You, now, there are some professors that are just plain mean, and they give you tests just to hurt you. <laughs> but those are far and few between. Most tests in school are there to test you to make sure that you have the information and the knowledge and that you're prepared to go to the next bigger thing, to go to the next grade, to go to the next level. And that's the same with God. God wants to test you in your life to make sure you're prepared to receive the next blessing he has for you. If he gives you um, this financial thing and you don't steward it well, that's a test. Why would he entrust you with more? I think overarching, that encompasses every single one of the passions that God's put on my life and called me to for my life. You know, being committed, not quitting, um, being a all-in Christian, not just a Christian in word, but like living in what God's called me to be. It starts with that of that God has made every single person for a purpose, and we can't be distracted and never discover what it is because God wants us to grow for our benefit and his glory. And that goes for every single person in every single stage of life, no matter how old or how young you are. Uh, remember, man, Moses was Moses was a prince until he was 40 years old. And the Bible in Hebrews says that he thought, wow, God must have made me a prince so that I would have the position and authority to set his people free. And then he blew it and he murdered somebody. And so he ran away and he was a shepherd for 40 years in a different country and then God came to him and said, hey, Moses, you remember that dream that I put in your heart, that passion I gave to you when you were young? That is my plan for your life. Just not in the way, th it's not going to be through your authority and your power. It's going to be through my authority and my power. And at that point, Moses was like, no, you got the wrong guy. But he's 80 years old at the burning bush. He's 80 years old. And that was old then too. <laughs> he lived to 120 and he was a really old guy. Okay, so, so people are like, well, yeah, they lived longer back then. Yeah, but Moses was still old at 80 years old. He, he was living in an era where 120 people lived to be that old, but it wasn't normal even then. Man, just be encouraged. No matter where you're at in your life, you can't do anything about the past. You can only say yes today, and God will do more with your yes today than you could ever imagine. So that's my hopefully just inspiration and encouragement because I just truly, truly believe it for every single person who's listening to this, that, that you can accomplish whatever God has in store for you to accomplish. If you'll give him your life, if you'll surrender and you'll commit and not be, not quit, you, you might be discouraged, but don't quit, uh, no matter what. And, um, uh, 
and don't be distracted from the growth moments that God has for your life. Yeah, Michael, thank you so much uh, for hanging out and just giving some wisdom and advice today. We really appreciate it. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, man. Yeah. Thanks so much. And I'm praying blessings on you as you're starting this podcast uh, that God uses it and this ministry to inspire and encourage and grow so many people. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Would you mind, would you pray just for the people that are listening? Would you just close us in prayer? Lord, I thank you for this opportunity that we have. And Lord, I just pray a blessing on every single person who's listened to this podcast at any point in time, God, that you would utilize it in their life to be a changing point, a springboard, a a spark. God, I pray that it might just be a little thing. Maybe it's in how they view their spouse. Maybe their marriage is falling apart. Maybe it's in how they view their kids. Maybe they're, they're not giving their kids the mental or emotional uh, focus that they need. God, maybe it's just in getting rest. Maybe it's in their ministry. Whatever it is, God, I just pray that you would utilize this so much more than Michael or I could ever, ever dream or hope, God, in somebody's life. And Lord, I just pray this blessing over every single one of us, that we would be the best stewards of our life that we can possibly be for your glory and our good. In Jesus' name. Wow. Thanks so much for listening to the Sharper Together podcast. I hope you were as encouraged as I was from today's episode with Pastor Michael Tyson of Bedrock Church Bozeman. If you enjoyed this conversation and want more like it, please subscribe to the podcast and leave a review on whatever platform you love most. The more subscriptions and reviews we receive means the more and more people that will hear about this podcast and be encouraged, empowered, and equipped in their walk with the Lord. We'll see you next time as we stay sharper together. Premium.